the United States is no longer seen as a credible security guarantor in the region. And the countries of the region have come of age. I have seen very clearly each of them is exercising strategic autonomy. They don't want to be enemies of the Americans. They don't want to be allies of China or Russia. They want to be in a position to articulate their own interests and concerns and then take decisions on foreign affairs which are in their national interest rather than in the interest of the Americans. So I would say to my American brethren, please do not have this narrow-minded approach of, of if someone is not with you, he is against you. They are not against you. They are only exercising their personal dignity. Understand that, respect that. Welcome to Conversations. I'm your host, Muqtadar Khan. And as you can see, uh, I have with me our distinguished guest, uh, Ambassador Talmiz Ahmed, who has been India's ambassador of several countries, Saudi Arabia, Oman, United Arab Emirates. Uh, and he is a prolific scholar and writer. This is his latest book, as you can see, West Asia at War. Uh, I used it last semester when I was teaching an undergraduate class on Middle East affairs, and I plan to use it again next year when I do that. It's a very, very good book, which combines both the practitioner's point of view as well as the scholar's point of view. And today we are going to talk about the impact uh, on the global order of what's going on in the Middle East, uh, in the Gaza uh, war, as well as uh, the I don't know even how to describe what the Houthis are doing, uh, other than to say that they have expanded the conflict uh, beyond the borders of Israel. Uh, so welcome uh, to Conversation, uh, Talmiz Ahmed Saab. But before we begin, I want to thank you for hosting me for a dinner, such a fantastic dinner, and I got to meet with all of your colleagues. It felt as if I was at a mini Raisina dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> while we were having dinner. Uh, so, it was a great pleasure that you could be with us. Yes, thank you very much, sir. And those of you who are coming to Conversations for the first time, please subscribe to the channel, like this video, press the bell icon, and share it with your friends and your social network. So, tell me, Saab, the, the, I have, uh, we, there are four things that are going on. One is the war in Gaza, which is perhaps one of the most brutal things that we have seen in a long time. Uh, and then we see the war in Ukraine, which seems to be unending. The conflict in the Middle East has expanded to what is happening uh, in the seas, in the Mediterranean, near the Red Sea uh, and the Arabian Sea, uh, with the Houthis uh, targeting all the shippings that go through the Suez Canal. Uh, and on top of all of this, uh, it is a clear perception that there are new powers that are emerging. Uh, India, obviously, a rise of China, rise of Saudi Arabia, Brazil. So there is this perception that we are in a moment of flux and the global order is changing. Uh, so my first question to you is, how do you see the Middle East and what is happening in the Middle East? And how is that impacting uh, the existing global order? Are we going into a state of no order or is there a new world order emerging? The way to understand what is happening in the various parts of the world that you have mentioned, and specifically the Middle East, we have to frame it in a certain fundamental concept. The fundamental concept is the hegemony of the West over world affairs for at least two to three hundred years which is now being challenged. The first challenge had come, it was a domestic challenge. It came in the shape of the rise of fascism and specifically Germany and Italy. And it was vanquished and, and Japan. And it was vanquished. Then you had the Cold War. The Cold War was another challenge. Possibly uh, it was an ideological challenge. And that was also ended that also ended in favor of the West. 
since then for the last 30 and odd years, you have had the rise of other powers, the rise of the rest. And they have emerged over the last three decades and are viewed in Washington and in certain capitals in Europe as a threat to Western hegemony. Let us be specific here. As far as Ukraine is concerned, it is being seen as a challenge to the West from an old enemy, an old foe, Russia. And large numbers of people in the West, particularly in Washington, are seeing the Ukraine conflict in terms of a revival of the Cold War with the difference that this time, China and Russia are on the same side against the West. That is framing the, the encounter in terms of democracy versus authoritarianism, uh, the rule-based order versus brute force, etc. But as if to contradict this framing, you have the Palestinian issue, the Israel-Palestinian issue, which goes back to the uh, early part of the last century and steadily it's a Western project. That is why countries in India, countries like India and other Asian countries never saw uh, the return of, of Jews to the Holy Land in terms of an anti-colonial struggle. They actually saw it as part of a colonial enterprise in order to vanquish the aspirations of the Arabs. So you see that now. The problem for the West is this. Number one, that you have the inexorable rise of certain powers who are asserting a space for themselves in world affairs. They no longer want to be subordinate to the Western diktat. That worked for a fairly long time. And in the case of West Asia, I would say to you, it worked till about three or four years ago. Uh, there were countries like Syria and uh, Iran uh, that were less amenable uh, to the uh, Western diktat, Western hegemony. But most of the Gulf countries and several other Arab countries were subordinate to Western uh, affiliation. They were they were subord they were a subordinate ally of the West. But you have the rise of Russia and China, and then you have various other countries asserting is what we now call loosely strategic autonomy. But what is the problem here? The problem is that the very principles that Western powers assert in support of their hegemony, that is democracy versus repression, rule-based rule, rule -based order versus brute force, is it, it is contradicted by what they are supporting in West Asia, in the Gaza. Here you have exercise of brute force, an open, direct and brutish contradiction as far as the rule-based order is concerned. You have the extraordinary violence wreaked upon the Palestinians, all which is depicted very effectively on our television screens. And yet the world's hegemonic leader uh, from the West refuses to close, refuses to intervene totally supports the Western project that is Israel. And therefore, you find that this is where they are now going. What Washington is talking about now is not about a multipolar, uh, multipolar order. They are talking about the binary order. They are talking about a binary. That is, for them, the scenario today is entirely the revival. Uh, it is a so-called Cold War. So is we it don't believe that. So, we believe that that is, uh, that is a travesty. Overwhelmingly, major countries in the world, including developing countries, don't want a binary and don't believe in a binary struggle. So um, I, my previous show that I did on conversations was about a meeting hosted by uh, the Indian Embassy uh, in Germany and the ORF Foundation where uh, Dr. Jai Shankar and the Saudi ambassador were engaging with the former prime minister of Canada and a couple of others. And it appeared as if that the countries of the global South uh, were talking about the, the world order as if it's a multipolar order with the emergence 
you know, rise of Saudi Arabia financially, the rise of India, uh, and also many other countries, Indonesia, Brazil, also are emerging as middle level powers. But the Westerners seem to be seeing this as a collapse of the liberal order. But when they talk about the binary, it is not just US versus China. It is, I think, the West versus the rest. And they are they are refusing to articulate it in that way. But it does appear that even in their mind, it is the West versus the rest. Well, you see, here we have a clear parallel in the non-alignment. You remember how much in the West they hated the non-alignment. Yes. John Foster Dallas told us that if you're not with us, you are against us. A view that has been echoed regularly in the United States, whether it was George Bush Jr. Um, or later on even Donald Trump. That means they have this sense, the conflictual approach to world affairs. That if you are, and when they say you're not with us, you are against us, they don't mean as equal partners. United States has no understanding of partnership. I have coined the term for them. Is the, This is the term that Wellesley had coined in India. He used the term subsidiary alliance. That <laughs> means you are my ally, but you are my servant. You yeah. are subject to me. You are subordinate to me. Your principal role in world affairs is to support my strategic agenda. However flawed it might be, however short term it might be, However violent it might be, however subjective it might be, you have to support me. The minute you do not support me, you are the enemy and I exercise all authority to, conf to confront you and to harm you. Now, there are many countries that have since then emerged, which don't want, they don't want conflict, but they don't want to be subordinate to the West and certainly not to the United States. I want to point out to you the extraordinary change that has occurred uh, in the Gulf, uh, the Gulf countries, the, uh, I mean, the Arab Gulf, Arabian countries of the Gulf, they owed their existence to Western powers. Initially, they were subordinate to the British and had various agreements in terms of which they were subservient to British interests. Then they were handed over to the Americans during the Cold War as the British withdrew east of Suez, and they truly believed that insecure as they were, their security was entirely dependent on their acceptance of an affiliation with the Americans. Even if the American agenda very frequently was not in their interest. Recall here, they supported the West against Saddam Hussein in 91, but they didn't want the sanctions inspections regime, the no-fly zones, the dual containment. The, then you had the problem of 9-11 uh, and then you had the problem of Iraq. They supported the Americans against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, but they had completely the opposed uh, the, the Americans with regard to the attack upon Iraq. But the Americans listened to no one. And as far as the region was concerned, they went along with the American agenda to the cost. To, the, to their own cost and to the cost of stability in the region. But now you see from 2020 onwards, it's very clear, if I want to put a date, it's 2020, but the feeling had come nearly 10 years earlier. The United States is no longer seen as a credible security guarantor in the region. And the countries of the region have come of age. I have seen very clearly each of them is exercising strategic autonomy. They don't want to be enemies of the Americans. They don't want to be allies of China or Russia. They want to be in a position to articulate their own interests and concerns and then take decisions on foreign affairs which are in their national interest rather than in the interests of the Americans. So I would say to my American brethren, please do not have this narrow-minded approach of of if someone is not with you, he is against you. They are not against you. They are only exercising their personal dignity. Understand that, respect that. Part, part of the reason, I think, one of the new trends that you see in the Gulf, especially Saudi Arabia, 
is that in their pursuit of national interest and their uh, pursuit clearly of strategic autonomy. I was listening to Prince uh, Faisal talk about it uh, and, and contrasted that with Dr. Jai Shankar. Dr. Jai Shankar feels the confidence to say, look, uh, if, if it is in our interest to go with Russia, we will go with Russia. If it is in our interest to go with the US and the West, we will go with it. Uh, we, we feel that the world is full of opportunities and we want to maximize that. But Prince Faisal was saying it in a very interesting way. He, uh, uh, This is the lingering subsidiary status. He was saying that nations have grown and they, their economic capabilities have grown and they can take care of the, uh, the their regional security if they are allowed to do it. And, and, and this, this allowed to do it, you know, if they were inc incorporated. So it, it, it appeared as if he, he still felt the constraints that the U.S. was imposing on his foreign policy, on Saudi foreign policy, whereas Dr. Jayashankar clearly was not... See, India, there's a small difference. And the difference is this. India has pursued non-alignment, later called strategic autonomy, from 1947. Yeah. In the worst possible period in world affairs, when we were pressurized so much by the West, we still took independent posture, where our interests required... We went along with the Soviet Union, but we, where we felt that this was not something that we could go along with, we kept a low profile. I'm not saying we opposed it, both with regard to Hungary and Czechoslovakia, you will remember. India was not happy about it, but we kept a low profile. The dependence on the political dependence on the Soviet Union was very substantial and it worked for us. Recall here what happened in 1971 where the Americans were totally supportive of Pakistan, politically and militarily, equipped Pakistan to the hill, and then threatened India. Uh, that if India expanded the conflict further, there would be military consequences as far as India is concerned. The, we were protected very robustly by the Indo-Soviet Treaty. Yeah. We have to remember that August 1971, we made the Russians made it clear that they were not going to allow India to be bullied. And that is what happened. And that is what uh, we, uh, we cherish and we continue to cherish. That means India is familiar with the exercise of autonomy in foreign policy decision making from 1947. The Saudis are not. At the very time India was going to uh, lead the non-aligned movement, of which Saudi Arabia was a member, King, Sau uh, King Abdulaziz, Ali Saud, actually met uh, President Roosevelt uh, in 1945 and worked with him to build a strategic partnership that persisted till a few years ago. But Nobody so, has but rejected it. But some... do recall, just one moment, do recall, the strategic partnership he entered into with the Americans was to protect Saudi Arabia against the British. Yeah. Uh, and that, that is... But the Saudis today, yes, slowly but surely, they are taking steps to build a foreign policy that would safeguard their interests, even if it means going against the American agenda. Uh, the, the, I mean, I totally agree with you. And in '56, even Egypt was seeking American partnership as protection from Britain and Israel, uh, if you remember the war of Suez Canal. But uh, what I was planning to uh, intending to add about countries like Saudi Arabia and uh, to some extent United Arab Emirates is that these two countries at least have not only become autonomous to, to a great extent from the US uh, in spite of the you know uh, the legacy of uh, US uh, hegemony in the region but these two countries are also pursuing a new kind of nationalism, which is also making them autonomous of the so-called OIC and the Islamic umbrella and also the Arab umbrella. So, so their solidarity with Arabness uh, and their solidarity with uh, this so-called Islamicness so is, is being diluted in pursuit of a new nationalism where the, the whole nationalism is measured in terms of economic and GDP development. And so, so, so do you think that that's perhaps that has also uh, empowered them uh, 
besides the fact that their GDP has grown and they are also now buying a lot of weapons to become autonomous of the U.S.? I think you are absolutely right. The Saudis are relative newcomers to this scenario. Let us accept that and admit that. Yeah. I appreciate their boldness and their self-confidence. They still have issues. What you are looking at is that all the countries of the Gulf have, number one, domestic issues, number two, regional issues, and only that number three, the third part of the concentric circle, do they have to worry about the world order. The domestic scenario is the one that uh, Saudi Arabia is grappling with most robustly today because they are today focused on the emergence of the new leader, uh, uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, he has he has shaped his leadership on principles quite different from those uh, that had been promoted by his ancestors over the last century. He's talking about modern and moderate Islam. And he's talked about shaping the ethos of his nation, not on the basis of being Arab or being Islamic, but on the basis of being nationalist. Absolutely correct. And this is the way there is a domestic facet to this and there is a regional facet. Saudi Arabia is not unique in this regard. The UAE is doing the same thing. The Emirates, the uh, Qataris are doing the same thing. The Kuwaitis are doing the Bahrainis as well as the Omani. They are aware that they are Arab, they are Muslim and they are Khaliji. But they are also promoting because they many of them have new leaders. They have, they are creating, uh, they're shaping a new national order. With regard to the region as such, you still have a large number of unresolved issues. You have the big, when you, when I speak of strategic autonomy, may I recall to you straight away, the Saudi decision to engage with Iran uh, with, under the, on the basis of uh, good offices provided by the Chinese totally against the American agenda in the region, but a celebration of what the Saudis believe is in their interest. The Turks are doing almost the same thing, reaching out to Saudi Arabia as well as Iran and working with the UAE and working with the Egyptians as well, reaching out also uh, uh, to uh, the Iraqis. So you have all these countries building a multiplicity of relationships not necessarily dividing the region between us and them, but wanting to bring the region together on the platform of peace and diplomacy rather than confrontation. The Americans have not understood this message that you don't need to serve your interest only through military force. I would point out to the Chinese, you don't have Chinese soldiers uh, and Chinese frigates and Chinese submarines all over the place threatening the region. They have a presence insofar as defending their national interest is concerned, but overwhelmingly they use diplomacy and their own substantial economic ties with the region across the board in order to promote regional stability and peace and at the same time promote their own interest. Sir, sir in this, uh, one of the things that is happening is that the perception that countries are no more overwhelmed by the U.S. power and the weakening of Europe. Uh, so if you look at the, the, the so-called battle between the West and the Houthis, it's only the United States with, with British who are out there. It's not like a NATO enterprise. You don't see Germany or France joining with the U.S. Uh, in combating the Houthis. So in many ways, we are clearly seeing the weakening of Western control on these things. Uh, and so because the hegemon is becoming weaker, it is creating spaces for other players to play a role. So as the, a new order emerges or we continue in a, an orderless or, or the weakening of the international liberal order, what role do you see India playing in the Middle East uh, going forward? You see, here is an area of extraordinary disappointment for me. My own understanding has been, and this is based on 40 years of intervention of my personal presence in the region and engagement over four decades with the region and a deep-seated admiration 
for the people of the region and some understanding of where they have come from and where they would like to go. I have noted a very deep affection for India, a deep respect for India, a very high regard for India. And this is not something that, you, uh, that emerges overnight. And I have pointed out several times that this relationship goes back to the Indus Valley civilization when we engaged with the Sumerians and with the Egyptians and we were all over the place across the Arabian Peninsula. If you dig anywhere uh, through archaeological teams in different parts of the, of the Gulf, you will find the evidence of connectivity with India. And this has continued uninterrupted and it has constantly been refreshed. The, in, the region's familiarity with India is buttressed by a very high level of cultural comfort. Therefore, I had thought and I have believed very strongly over the last decade and odd that India should have been a major role player in promoting peace and stability in the region. Not militarily, but on the basis of the very close ties that it has with every country of the region. I had argued in writing that India is respected that India's bona fides are intact and nobody believes in the region that India has an agenda beyond the, uh, beyond the region's welfare. We also have very high stakes in regional stability. Our energy, our economic cooperation and the presence of our community and increasingly our maritime concerns in the Western Indian Ocean. But what I have seen with, and I was also very enthusiastic when Prime Minister Modi strengthened our traditional ties and engaged so robustly with every country of the region. I love that. But what I have noted with some concern over the last three or four years, that India has not translated this affinity, this regard and this respect into a strategic vision and a strategic role. India has opted out. And as I have mentioned to you earlier, India has shaped its engagement with the region on the basis of strong bilateral relations. Now, you cannot be a strategic role player in a region if you don't view the region as a collective entity. On the basis of robust bilateral relations, you cannot be a strategic role player. And I think this is where India has decided self-consciously to opt out. So basically, what India is doing now is India, to have sporadic ties. Yeah, so India doesn't have a Middle East policy or West Asia policy. India has a Oman policy, UAE policy, Saudi. Absolutely Asia. correct. Well, so this is the this is the shortcoming that has uh, that has circumscribed and limited severely our role in the region at a time when Saudi Arabia and Iran were confronting each other uh, in the wake of the Arab Spring. And the whole region was in turmoil. And then you had uh, the rise of Donald Trump and the chaos that he brought in his wake. At that time, I actually felt very strongly that India should be a presence in the region and that we should we should have been the one that, sh that should have brought Saudi Arabia and Iran talking to each other. Compare us with China. China uh, is a relative newcomer to the region. Yes, it has substantial economic ties, but so do we. But we have an advantage they don't have. We've been in the region for 5,000 years. They've been in the region for a decade and all, maybe two decades. There is no comparison. In so fact, they, when I used to yeah. talk about a peace process in the region, the Chinese used to defer to me, <laughs> saying, you go ahead because we don't know the region and you know them. You know, the, I mean, there's no doubt about it. I have traveled extensively in most of the North African Arab countries, Egypt, Morocco, Turkey, etc. Wherever I go, the moment people hear that I'm from India, there's the level. You can see the perception that the le level of respect goes up. Uh, and every time I said I'm from the U.S., uh, the level of suspicion would go up, <laughs> and they would be like totally puzzled. The guy from India, who's who is an American who speaks Arabic, uh, it it used to create some kind of confusion. But the the, the respect for India and uh, Hindustan uh, was uh, all over. But like right now in in this moment, 
uh, are you happy or disappointed with the minimalist role that India is playing in the uh, the the Arab Israeli conflict, the Gaza war? Could India have done more uh, at this moment? To India should have done. India could have done, but you see, you can't overnight do. You should be a player in the region. You should be a player in the regional affairs. You should be engaging with different members of the region collectively. That's the way China has a platform, China Arab platform, a China GCC platform. You remember when Xi Jinping visited the, the region in December 2022, he had a bilateral meeting with Saudi Arabia. He had a meeting with the G GCC and a, had a meeting with the OIC and the Arab League. Yeah. The sense of collective approach to the region has been entirely missing from the Indian agenda. What, uh, and that is a serious shortcoming. It's not only about West Asia. I would say the same is true of Southeast Asia and Central Asia. But we are focused on West Asia. And that is where I can speak to you with complete confidence that I believe we should have done much more. Much more was expected of us. Recall here all the joint statements that uh, Prime Minister Modi concluded. So what you find is that unless you have a strategic vision, and you deploy resources over the long term. You believe in your role in the region. You are, are prepared to be patient. And you have the resources to be employed, to be deployed in this large enterprise, long term enterprise. With regard to the Gulf, I, I, with regard to Gaza, I would only say with deep disappointment that the Indian response to the war and the early days of the war was mocked by confusion a kind of contradiction between the impulses of the political leadership and what the traditional diplomatic craft demanded of us. And as of now, we actually sort of struck own goals in the beginning, made ourselves irrelevant as far as the region is concerned, as far as doing anything in the region is. After that, we were simply voting sometimes for a certain resolution, sometimes abstaining on a certain resolution, increasingly making ourselves irrelevant. And somebody asked me, and I'm going to speak frankly to you, somebody asked me, uh, what is the response to the region uh, with regard to India's voting record in the UNGA? And I said, I don't think a single capital in the world is waiting with bated breath to hear what India has to say. They don't care because you are not relevant. You have made yourself irrelevant. And that is the sad narrative. You know, we what, should have been all over the place, but we were not. Uh, well, I think that the confusion was perhaps the Indian government did not anticipate that this uh, Israeli response would be so brutal and so prolonged. And so they, they basically reacted by saying, oh, we are fundamentally opposed to terrorism and this Islamic terrorism coming from Hamas, we must condemn. And that explains Prime Minister Modi's uh, phone call. But then they subsequently realized that, oh, oh shit, we recognize uh, the two-state solution. And India is was the first non-Arab country, I think, to recognize the state of Palestine. And yeah, this thing is very rich. And yeah. very solid. So that credibility, I, that credibility, I don't think that history matters to the present leadership whatsoever. They, they. In fact, I want to say to you with some degree of concern that the Hamas attack was viewed by large sections of Indian opinion, particularly the political leadership, as an act as a typical example of Islamic extremism. And the narrative that was then built up was, firstly, there is no distinction between Muslims and Muslim extremism. They are all viewed as one. Uh, they are viewed as a threat. And in fact, a narrative emerged in India that when the party would go to the elections, the ruling party would go to the elections in two, or, in two months, they would make Hamas violence as an election issue pointing out that the Muslims have not changed and they remain wedded to violence in the shape of jihad. So this was the narrative, which is completely false. Somebody asked me and I said, please, I would advise my brethren uh, in the BJP 
that there are enough issues in India that you can run your campaign on. Don't go in for a topic with which you have no knowledge. You don't know the history. You don't know the politics. You don't know where it is going. I would advise you to keep away. You know, that point was good. I, and I, I found that it was a great opportunity for India to actually assert its leadership in the region. Uh, uh, and uh, given the fact that uh, it was the first country to recognize Palestine, India has an ambassador. Uh, I did speak with Doctor uh, with uh, Ambassador Zikru Rahman, if you remember, who was actually India's ambassador, and he he served both in Gaza as well as the West Bank. Uh, I, I he did come on the show and talk about this. So so to me, I think that this was a lost opportunity, but. You could also say that India is still, you know, uh, a new player on the big front. And right now, I think India's focus seems to be to find a place for India in the global governance. So I was looking at the Raisina dialogue. I was listening to what was happening in Munich. And uh, I mean, India is repeatedly talking about UN security reforms. And uh, while simultaneously saying that the big guys on top are probably not going to allow it unless there is a a uh, significant disaster and a huge shift in the balance of power. So uh, I, I think you, you are right to raise these issues. You will get a multiplicity of responses from India and from different scholars in India. My own view is that our diplomacy is floundering. It is directionless. It is without strategy. It is without vision. And unless you have a vision and then you develop a strategy to support that vision and you have clarity about what your role should be as part of this larger vision, you're going nowhere. You can't, you can't do diplomacy through reaction. Something happens somewhere, you react and they call it foreign policy. It is not. It has to be supported by a vision. And my own concern is that we don't seem to have a vision that would give us direction and clarity either in our region, the broad region that is India's strategic space, that is Eurasia and the Indian Ocean, nor do I believe we have a vision with regard to our place in world order. What you have is slogans. Oh, we should be in the Security Council. Oh, we are a great power already. We are going to be the third economy. And everybody respects India and what a great country we are. That does not make you a great country. That does not make you a leader of the nations. I also would advise a certain degree of humility here. Don't talk about leadership and certainly not leadership of the global south. The whole point about the global south is that we are all equal. That we respect each other as equals. The fact and that is what distinguishes us from our American brethren who don't believe in equality and partnership. Therefore, I think that we should, some degree of humility, but internally, the development of a vision based on a certain uh, culture, a vision and strategy and deployment of resources to support that strategy. You know, on that powerful note, I mean, that's a really very, very strong statement, uh, Ambassador Saab, and I hope that uh, I will try my best to make sure, and I'm sure you can also share with your colleagues, and I'm sure a lot of them do also agree with you, that uh, I want to thank you for coming here and speaking. You always speak so candidly, and I want to remind the viewers uh, that please grab this book if you can. If you want to understand what's happening in the Middle East right now, this is one of the best books uh, 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 that will help you understand. Uh, and this is an Indian edition, so so you're not paying a lot of dollars for it either. So, uh, Ambassador Saab, thank you very much for being on Conversation. Thank you very much, uh, yeah. and I wish you all the best. Thank and a very speedy recovery from all the um, things that are <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I, you. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Talmi Sahab. And for all of you who are watching, please uh, subscribe to Conversation, like this video, press the bell icon, and do share it with your friends and your social political network. And until next time, I'm your host, Mukhtadar Khan. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much.